Okay. Is everyone ready to continue to out of order execution? Now that we, we built up a lot of background on uh, digital design, finally we're able to get to something that's really, really interesting, frankly. What we're going to cover today, including the reorder buffer, is employed in all processors that we have today, basically. All interesting processors, I should say. High performance. This has, for example, a reorder buffer plus out of order execution employed in it. And that's why it's fast. <laughs> so we will see these concepts. But remember, uh, Frank uh, finished at reorder buffer last time. I want to pick it up because it's such an important concept. It's an important concept that you need in a von Neumann architecture. Because in von Neumann architecture, you know that instructions have to be processed sequentially, right? You have to, whatever you do in the microarchitecture, you may change things, but you shouldn't expose that to the user, the programmer. So if for some reason, instructions get out of order internally, you need to reorder them. And that's the purpose of the reorder buffer. And even though we're not uh, scheduling instructions out of the program order, you've seen a case where things may finish out of order, even in a pipeline uh, that, uh, in, a, in a pipeline that we discussed last time. And I'll, I'll give you that again. So you need to reorder things. So this concept is applicable to in-order processors as, as well as out-of-order processors. Whenever you need to complete instructions out of order, you need to reorder them before reporting them to the software, before updating the architectural state. So reporting to software means updating the architectural state. Architectural state means registers, uh, program counter, and memory. Okay. So hopefully you're doing the readings. This is actually the reading I assigned. Who has done this, that reading? The microarchitecture of super, okay, good. I hope more people do that reading because this is really important. And the concepts that we're going to discuss are really not covered. There is a chapter uh, that talks about out of order execution in Harris and Harris, but it's, it's relatively superficial. So this is an area where the textbooks are really out of date in my opinion. If I ever write a textbook, it'll be similar to the flow of these lectures. Okay, uh, and optionally, if you really want to know how a modern processor looks like, I have this optional reading I've assigned. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe tomorrow a little, bit, a little bit. And next week, we're gonna cover branch prediction. This is also another hot topic that's really important employed in this. This has many forms of branch predictors. Whenever it gets to a branch instruction, control flow instruction, it predicts what should, what should it fetch next. And all programs have branches. Actually, if you look at studies, in many studies, you see that uh, more than 20% of the instructions and programs are branches because you need to make a decision based on the data, right? Okay, we'll see the branch problem next time. It's a fascinating problem. So you should read this uh, for next week. Okay, so this is uh, not where we stopped last time, but this is to motivate where we stopped. Basically, the problem arises in an in-order process when you have multiple cycle execution. Not all instructions take the same amount of time. Uh, as a result, different instructions can take different amounts of time. You still send the instructions to the function that's in program order sequentially, but for example, this instruction that you sent earlier may take eight cycles. The instruction that you sent later, later in the program sequence may take only one cycle. So the question is, this instruction finishes before this instruction, and do you update the register file at that point in time? If you update, Bad things happen. Well, what are those bad things? Basically, this is what happens if you update the register file out of order. This instruction completes late because it's a floating point multiply. It takes eight cycles. This instruction completes early, even though it's fetched and decoded in program order. And if you update the register file at this point, you may run into problems because you're not really obeying the von Neumann semantics anymore, which says you update the register file, update the architectural state sequentially. So what could be a bad problem? It could be that this floating point multiply may never complete. Why? Because, I don't know, you're multiplying with and not a number, right? Actually, I, it, it, it's better if the example is a divide. If you're dividing by zero, what's the, what should be the result? Anybody? Yes? Exception, exactly. It's basically undefined as a result. A good machine should tell you that I don't know what, how, what to do with it, so it's exception, exceptional. So the program should stop at this point and tell the user that there's a problem with this particular instruction. But if the machine was designed to do this, 
Now you've updated the architectural state with some other instructions, and it becomes a nightmare for the programmer to figure out what's going on. Right? The programmer doesn't know. But the programmer should, ex in a von Neumann architecture, expects that this instruction, uh, when this instruction has an exception, nothing after that should be completed. Right? That's the semantics. That's the hardware software contract. That's what the programmer expects. If the ISA does not uh, obey this, then you have a problem. Debugging becomes actually a nightmare. If you actually try to debug a system like this, you'll probably start getting rid of your hair. <laughs> not good. <laughs> And in the, in the past, 1960s, 70s, 80s, had a lot of machines that were like this, that did not support uh, the von Neumann semantics. And as a result, they were impossible to debug. OK, so I, 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 spent, I spent more time than needed over here, but this is just to reinforce the concept. So basically, we should not update architectural state that's visible to the programmer. Uh, and we're updating registers in this case. We could also update memory locations. This could be a memory update and you update a memory location and you get an exception. Now the value has changed and the programmer doesn't know uh, that that value should have changed. Okay, so uh, how do you actually solve the problem? Basically, we need to obey the semantics. Uh, architectural state should be consistent or precise when an exception or an interrupt is ready to be handled and Frank covered exception and interrupts. These are similar except they're different in various ways, but I'm not gonna cover them, you should know them. Interrupt is really external to the process. So I'm running a program and something external happens. Somebody inputs something in the keyboard. When do you handle it? Exception is really internal to the process. That floating point divide instruction has an exceptional condition. So you really need to handle it at that point in time because the program cannot continue. Whereas if somebody inputs something in the keyboard, maybe you can delay that a little bit until you really need it. Right? OK, so uh, when, when something like this happens, something exceptional, all, all previous instructions should be completely retired or finished. And no later instruction should be retired. So the architectural state should be precise at that point. Make sense? And retire has actually multiple names. It's called commit or finish execution and update architectural states. Some people call it graduate. Also, you finish, graduate an instruction. OK, uh, so how do you check for exceptions? We covered this in the last uh, lecture. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But basically, there needs to be some logic at the back end of the machine that checks if the oldest instruction that is ready to be retired at this point, is there an exception related to it? If there is uh, an exception, then the control logic basically takes some action and ensures that the architectural is, uh, state is precise. If you're doing uh, something like a reorder buffer, we ensure that all the time. Uh, it flushes all the younger instructions in the pipeline because there's an exception with this instruction. Everything else doesn't matter. You shouldn't have executed them anyway from a von Neumann perspective. It saves the program counter and the registers as specified by the ISA. There's an ISA specification that says, what should you do when an exceptional condition happens? What should the programmer expect that the hardware provides to them when there's an exception in the program so that the programmer can debug what's going on? And then uh, uh, the, uh, the, the machine redirects the fetch engine to, uh, uh, to the appropriate exception handling routine. Exception could be divided by zero exception. Exception could be illegal instruction exception. You decode an instruction, you don't know what it is because it's illegal. There's no opcode associated with it. Why could this happen? Someone wrote bad code, the compiler was bad, or you have a row hammer error, you have a bit flip. This could happen, right? In real life, this happens actually. When the machine has an illegal instruction, that's an exceptional condition, and then the, pro, uh, then the system jumps to a location that says, OK, I've seen an illegal instruction. I have no idea how to handle it. So a programmer, here's the information, figure out what happened. And then it's the job of the system or the programmer to figure out what happened. You could, of course, write another program that analyzes this uh, while the exception is going on, right? OK, so this is really important uh, because these things happen. And actually, there are many, many cases of exceptional conditions. OK, so why do we want precise exceptions? Clearly, uh, first of all, there, there's an issue with semantics. Sem we need to obey the semantics, von Neumann semantics, whereas data flow semantics doesn't require uh, this precise exceptions, but we're, we're t talking about von Neumann architectures. And there's a reason why these semantics are there, because it's easier for the programmer. The programmer can much more easily debug their programs if they know an instruction finishes uh, uh, basically, if, if, if they know that each instruction is executed sequentially. Yeah, I already said this. 
And there are other benefits also, which we're not going to get into, that Frank briefly talked about. So how do you ensure precise exception and pipelining in the presence of multiple cycle execution? Well, this is one way, and you've seen it in the last lecture. Basically, you can make each operation take exactly the same amount of time. Okay, you have an addition. It's, it should normally take one cycle, because your addition is very simple. Make it take as long as the longest operation that you have. Let's assume that it's multiply. If you're lucky if it's multiply, right? Multiply could be eight cycles over here. Now, this satisfies a property that every instruction writes to the register file in sequential order, because every instruction basically waits until uh, the longest latency instruction is complete. Works from a semantic perspective. Sounds like a bad idea from a performance perspective, right? Because now you extended, effectively extended your pipeline to be as long as the longest latency instruction. Every instruction takes as many cycles as the longest latency instruction. And that longest latency instruction can be very, very long latency. If you remember from last lecture, load can take hundreds or thousands of cycles. In fact, has anybody used Xbox at any point in their lives? Xbox 360, for example? You know what it is? It's a gaming engine, OK? More people are raising. Don't be shy. Uh, it's an older gaming engine, of course. But the Xbox, uh, how long do you think an access to memory took if you didn't hit in the caches? I'll give you a hint, it's more than 500 cycles. 650 cycles. So you don't want every, a single ad that would otherwise take a single cycle to take 650 cycles. Right. <laughs> so it makes no sense to do this. Okay. So that's why people have developed solutions that are written over here, and we're going to cover one of those solutions, which is the reorder buffer. Uh, this is employed in existing processors, but usually processors employ a combination of these techniques so that it can get high performance. Uh, but I'm not going to cover all of these techniques. These are really, really interesting techniques. And this paper covers the top three of them. It doesn't cover the checkpointing part. So you need to read other papers to cover the checkpointing part. Okay. So this is actually where we really stopped last time. Uh, well, at the end of the slide. <laughs> Basically, uh, the, 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 the solution idea is very simple. It's... it's you finish instructions in the order they finish. An ad takes one cycle, that's good. It produces result after one cycle. And you store the result somewhere, but not in the register. It, the idea is complete the instructions in out, uh, out of order, but reorder them before making the results visible to the architectural state. Hopefully this makes sense. Yeah, let me do this so that I can see better. So we add... Another structure into the pipeline, after an instruction completes, it writes its result into this reordering buffer, as opposed to directly writing to the register file, because the register file is visible to the programmer. You write it over here, and when the instruction becomes the oldest one, you take the value and write it into the register file at that point in time. So it's simple. This way, instructions can complete in any order over here, but then you reorder them before making them visible to the architectural state. That's true for the memory also. I, don't, I just don't show it memory. So uh, whenever a memory operation, uh, let's say a store, finishes, it writes its result into the reorder buffer, and then updates memory when it's really uh, the oldest instruction in the machine, and it doesn't have an exception. Okay, so how do you make it work? So you, you have the structure, it's a linear array that basically contains status of each instruction. Uh, it's like memory, uh, but it, to it, 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 it basically stores a status. When an instruction is decoded, it reserves the next sequential entry in this linear array, in the reorder buffer I'll call drop. Uh, when the instruction completes, over here, it writes its result into the reorder buffer entry. And when the instruction becomes the oldest in the reorder buffer, and it's completed without exception, so there has to be a finite state machine that checks this every cycle. Is, the old, is this oldest instruction done? It's, has it written its result? And does it have an exception? If it has its result written in the reorder buffer and doesn't have an exception, then basically that finite state machine takes the result and moves it to the destination register of the instruction. That's the idea. It's very simple. Or memory. Memory is just a bigger version of the register file uh, from this perspective. Okay. So basically, this reorder buffer structure 
buffers information about all instructions that are decoded, but not yet retired or committed or finished. Finished in the sense that they're out of the machine. So it needs to be big, as many instructions as you can support over here. Right. Every instruction that's decoded goes into the reorder buffer, and you take out the instruction when it actually is the oldest instruction. So if, just to give you an example, uh, today's uh, processors have reorder buffers of size about 250 or so. And it's increasing sometimes. Sometimes it's reducing also. Okay, so what's in a reorder buffer entry very quickly? Basically, you need all the information that, uh, about an instruction uh, so that you can keep track of the instruction status and write to the destination. So, of course, the order of a friend can be valid. Uh, you ha you ha if you're writing to a destination register, you need to store the destination register ID. You need to store the destination register value when it becomes available. Uh, if you're storing to memory, you need to have the address. You need to have the data when it becomes available. Uh, you need to have the program counter of the instruction so that whenever, if there's an exception, you use that to report to the user. Uh, and I mean, there's also some other valid bits for uh, these, these things and control bits. And of course, uh, an entry that says whether the instruction has caused an exception. Yes? So it's not that it's faster. It, it's, it's, it needs to be there so that you update the register file in sequential order. Okay? There's no real speed. Uh, actually, we'll talk about the speed later on. Uh, it's actually slower if you want to get the registers out of there. Okay? Okay, yes? Uh, if, uh, let's say the, the first instruction is uh, load and the second one is an addition. Wouldn't the addition still need to wait until the oldest one is finished? Or wouldn't the addition still need to wait the 600 cycles? Or the That's right, yeah. So if, if, the, if, the, this is, uh, if there's a dependent instruction, the pipeline stalls anyway. You don't get into the situation if there's a dependent instruction. You get into the situation if the instructions are independent, but they take different amounts of time, right? Because remember, we're still in, order, in an in-order pipeline. If you're decoding an instruction, and if the destination register value is not available yet, you stole the pipeline. Make sense? We're going to fix that problem later on when we, in this lecture when we talk about out-of-order execution. Okay, so basically, it's, uh, the, a reorder buffer needs to store everything that's required to correctly reorder instructions back into the program order. And we have a clear program order, as you know. Uh, everything that's required to update the architectural state with the instructions results, if the instruction can retire without any exceptions or any issues. And also, it, it, it needs to have uh, information uh, to handle an exception interrupt precisely if an exception or interrupt needs to be handled before retiring the instruction. So the color coding is because of that a little bit. So you need all of this to update the architectural state. You need the program counter so that whenever there's an exception, you need to report that to the user. This program counter had an exception. Uh, and of course, the bit, you need to also have that. Uh, and then also, you need to have these control bits to orchestrate everything. Okay. So, you of course need to have valid bits to keep uh, track of the readiness of the results. For example, if, if this reorder buffer entry is for an add instruction that has a destination register, Whenever you decode the add instruction, you set the valid bit of the reorder buffer entry, uh, you set the destination register ID, but you don't have the value yet. The value gets produced later when the add get, gets executed in the pipeline. At that point in time, you set the valid bit associated with this destination register value, which is stored somewhere over here. And for an add, uh, the finite state machine at the end checks uh, if, uh, if, the, if the add is valid, and if the destination register value is valid, then the add is done. And if there is no exception, that's good. And if, this, if it's also the oldest instruction, then you can write the uh, destination register value to the destination register ID in the register file. Okay, so conceptually it's very simple, but you need hardware to implement it, of course. So what does this enable? Basically it enables this picture. Assume these instructions are independent again. If, the, if you have a dependent instruction, so if, if the second instruction is dependent on the first instruction, you don't have this picture. Because this instruction, remember, we're, uh, we, we're, we're using scoreboarding or some, some other kind of dependency checking. If this instruction is, uh, requires a value that's written by this instruction, this needs to wait at this point, and it cannot proceed to execute. So you need to keep this instruction in decode stage until this finishes execution. 
that picture is different. This picture is for instructions that are all independent of each other, and there are cases where instructions are independent of each other. OK, so what, what happens here is now this instruction takes eight cycles. Uh, it writes its result into the reorder buffer after that, and then after that it writes the result into the, uh, uh, into the register file. So this is the reorder buffer write, and this is the register file write. Now this instruction, independent, it can execute, it's an add. When it's done, it writes its result into the reorder buffer, and it basically waits over there. And when this instruction is done, uh, this, this becomes the oldest and can update the register file, right? This way, you don't need to lengthen the execution of this instruction. You basically write the result into the reorder buffer, as you can see. These are all adds, and this multiply takes eight seconds. So the key thing over here is the writes are moved over here. Uh, the register file updates are moved over here so that they're in sequential order. So now the programmer doesn't go crazy. Okay. So there's a key question over here. What if a later instruction needs a value in the reorder buffer, if there's a dependence? This is not the case over here, but assume that there's some other instruction over here that you're fetching. It needs the value that was written by this instruction, let's assume. The value is there in the reorder buffer, but what do you do with that instruction now? It's actually produced, right? You know that, let's assume that this is writing to R2. Uh, this, uh, this second instruction is writing to R2. It's written the version of R2 over here into the reorder buffer. Let's assume that we fetched an instruction that needs R2 over here. Do you stall that instruction? Or do you somehow grab the value from the reorder buffer? If so, how do you grab the value from the reorder buffer? Well, one option is stall the operation. It stalls the pipeline. So basically, at that point in time, whenever you have a dependent instruction, you just stall. After that, uh, you need to wait until the value is written into the register file so that this imaginary instruction that I added can proceed. Not good for performance, right? So another option is to actually, you know that it, the value exists somewhere in the reorder buffer, so why don't you read the value from the reorder buffer? It turns out it's not very easy, so we're going to develop methods to actually read the value. Uh, and all existing processors do this. Those methods exist. But it's going to complicate our machine even more. So why do you want to do this? Because there's no reason to stall this instruction. The value has already been pr produced, right? You're just waiting for that value to update the register file. But if you actually read the reorder buffer, you get that value. And you can continue execution. You can keep filling the pipeline. So how do we read the value from the reorder buffer? Basically, now there are multiple places where a result exists in the pipeline. Recall, in the past, a result could exist in the register file, when it's written to the register file. A result could exist somewhere in the pipeline and could be bypassed. Remember forwarding of data, bypassing of data uh, last week? It could be bypassed. Now, a result can exist in the reorder buffer and nowhere else, right? If, 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 you, if, if an ad has finished execution, it's written its value over here. The value is over here. It's not here because the ad is done. It's not here, because the ad doesn't update the register file yet. So the value is over there. So a, a, a value of a register can exist in different places. And we need to be able to, if you want high performance, you need to be able to get it from different places. Remember, we introduced a bypass path so that you can get the value right after it's produced, so that the instruction doesn't need to wait until the value is written into the register file. If the value is produced over here in the function unit, just bypass it so that this instruction can continue executing quickly. I don't know what happened here. OK. So now some value can be here. Uh, OK. So the question is, how do we actually read the value in the reorder buffer? Basically, now we have, uh, I've shown you an example over here. When an instruction is being decoded, you can have these two paths. You access the register file, and you also access the reorder buffer at the same time. Now, this access is actually easy. You have a source register, R3, let's say. This is, uh, we'll see the memories later on, but this is called a random access memory, meaning we've seen this type of memory before. If you have a source register R3, you use R3 as the address, index the register file, and register file gives you the data, right, for R3. That's easy. And you have a linear array. But in the order buffer, you cannot do that. 
the ordering of registers is not in any order over here, because what this is is really an ordering of the instructions. An instruction may be writing to registers 10, the next instruction may be writing to register 5, the next instruction may be writing to register 50, if you have 50 registers. So basically, the value, the, the address you're looking for is really inside the content of each entry. You cannot just simply index this. You need to search in this hardware structure. So this is actually content addressable memory. So you need to search uh, this memory with the register ID, which is part of the content of an entry. Let me give you an example quickly of this, uh, because it's easier to look at an example over here, I think. If I can switch to the DocuCam. If the DocuCam is good for... OK, let's see. So basically, this is the, let's, let's start with the register file. OK, that's good. This is the register file, right? You get register source uh, 1. And let's assume that it's R3. This is all in order. Register 0 is here. You get 32 bits, let's say. Register 1 is here. Register 2 is here. Dot, dot, dot. Assuming you have 32 registers. What do you do to get register 3? Remember, you have an address decoder. You index using this address, and the address decoder activates this word line, and you get those 32 bits. Nice. It's simple. Now, the memory we have in the reorder buffer is completely different. Reorder buffer. Remember, each entry had a valid bit. This entry 0, entry 1, entry 2, dot, dot, dot. This is not the register ID. This is the ordering of the instructions. And remember, we have the destination register ID, assuming an instruction is writing to the register. It's stored in all of these locations for each instruction. So what you need to do if you want to ask for register 3 over here is to let me do it in a nice way. What do you need to do? You can need, oh, OK. Can you see? OK, let me actually shift to another one over here. If you want to do this, you need to compare, right? You have a value over here, value over here, which is the destination register ID of different instructions. You need to take this, ask if it's equal. That's not enough. You need to do it for every single entry. Ask if it's equal. Ask if it's equal. Ask if it's equal. And if you have 126 entries, like in Pentium 4, you need to do it for 126 entries over here. Doesn't sound like fun, right? I don't know how to do this. OK. So basically, this is the difference between, so you need to do it basically for every single entry. And if one of them matches, then you have register 3. And you've got a register 3 uh, destination register ID. And also, you have the destination register value. And if there's a match, you take the destination register value. Clearly, now this becomes not so uh, easy to implement, right? Think about how to implement this in logic. You have these matching lines. And essentially, you, you can have a huge mux. Right, where every single destination register value is connected to that mux. That's a lot. Maybe 126 of them, if you have 126 of these. And then the matching one selects the one that you really need. So basically, you're, we're searching for R3, register 3. Make sense? Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> There are multiple R3 entries. You take the youngest one, oh, yeah. right? Exactly. So now you're thinking ahead. That's good. This, uh, this, this structure allows you to have multiple R3 entries, right? So whenever you have an instruction writing to R3 and another instruction writing to R3, they can have multiple R3 entries they can, because they're in different locations. So remember, what is that? That's a write after write dependency. That's not a real dependency. So you can actually have different R3s over here. OK? OK, so you need to take the latest one. So it's actually more complicated than just a search. It's a search for R3. 
It's an ordered search. It's, you need to search for the latest one. Okay? Yes? Oh, okay. Now you're thinking even more deeply. How do you remember the, which one is the oldest? Well, hopefully there's an ordering uh, of this, right? Uh, so you have... So what you need to do is really a queue over here. There's a head pointer and there's a tail pointer. And tail pointer is the oldest one. And the head pointer, uh, sorry, tail pointer is the youngest one, and head pointer is the oldest one. Okay, and then you need to, it's really a circular queue that you're implementing in hardware in the end. Because you cannot do it with a fixed structure that is not circular. Okay, so hopefully this gives you, so this is basically the key difference between, this is, uh, maybe I need a different kind of pen. Let's see. I have green here, I don't know if it works. So this is really random access memory. Ran, and this is the uh, order buffer is really content addressable memory can. Why? Because in random access memory, the address is the address of the entry, the address you're looking for. It's easy to access. Here, you're looking for something that's inside the content that has nothing to do with the address. The address is all these 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, up to 125. But the content you're looking for is R3, which is really stored inside the content data. So you need to build this sort of structure to get the content, to match the content. OK. OK, so that's a reorder buffer uh, access for you. Let me go back to wherever I need to go back to. And now, when an instruction is decoded, it needs to access the register file and the reorder buffer. And if R3, let's assume that you're looking for R3, is here, you, need, you, get, you get the value from the reorder buffer. If R3 is not here, because this is the youngest definition of R3, right? But you, you need to have an ordering over here also, because the value may actually come from the bypass path. The R3 may be here, but it may not be produced yet. It may not be valid yet. There might be another instruction uh, that hasn't written to it, so you, then you actually get it from the bypass path. And if there is no instruction that's writing to R3 inside the reorder buffer, and if there is no instruction that's executing over here that's writing to R3, then you get the value from the register file. So a value can be present in different places, as you can see. OK, any questions? This is really important. This is going to be important for us in out-of-order execution also. OK. So this doesn't sound very good, because now my critical path may increase, right? If you look at the reorder buffer, uh, I'm searching for R3 here. Actually, I'm not just searching for R3. I have two sources if I have uh, a binary operation, right? I need to search for the source register 1 and source register 2. So this picture that I showed you over here becomes even more complicated. You don't need just one comparator for each destination register ID. You need two comparators for two sources. So it becomes even more expensive now. And also, uh, this latency uh, of the reorder buffer, search latency is much slower, because you need to go through, if you remember, all of these comparators and this huge mux multiplexer at the end. So the latency of the reorder buffer access is much longer. So what people do is trade off uh, uh, to, to reduce the critical path of this access is to use injection. Yes? Yeah. No, you need to take the youngest one. You're just fetching this instruction. You need to take the uh, value that's produced by the latest instruction in the program, right? So, okay, let me actually show you a picture over here very quickly. Uh, okay, Cam. So, let's assume that you have a bunch of instructions that are writing to R3. Multiply R3, uh, I don't know, divide, and the destination is R3 always. Now you're fetching an instruction add. This is the one that you're fetching and decoding. It needs R3. You need to get the youngest one, right? Because that's the program order. The oldest one you don't care about, actually. This also shows that this R3 has nothing to do with this R3, probably, right? 
unless there's a dependence. Okay, we'll get back to this, but you need to get the, old, the youngest value. Okay, so how do we actually get rid of uh, this reorder buffer search from being on the critical path? You use indirection. So basically, you augment the register file to be a, bit, a little bit more intelligent. You access the register file first and check if the register is valid. Remember the valid bits in the register file that we introduced for scoreboarding? We still have those valid bits. The register being invalid means that the register is being written by someone. And if the register is invalid, that means that it's somewhere in the reorder buffer, or, uh, and, the, and the instruction is either executing or it's finished. So you access the reorder buffer after that. Now the reorder buffer doesn't need to be content addressable anymore. So you can actually have an indirection that tells you which location in the reorder buffer is going to produce this R3. So how do you do that? If the register is not valid, it must be coming from an instruction that's somewhere in the reorder buffer. The register file then stores the ID of the reorder buffer entry that contains or that will contain the value of the register. So basically now we've mapped a register to a reorder buffer entry. A register file maps the register to a reorder buffer entry if there is an in-flight instruction writing to that register. So let me actually do this since we have built, not that one, DocuCam. Okay, DocuCam doesn't want to come. I don't know how to zoom out more. That's it. That's the best we can get apparently. So basically this is content addressable. We need this so that we can access reorder buffer entry and re uh, register file in parallel. But if your register file is slightly different and you use indirection, this is what we can do. So this is our register file, this is our reorder buffer. Zero through 31 again. And now register file has valid bits. And if the valid bit is one, you trust the value because someone has written it. If the valid bit is not one, Let's assume this is register three that we've been using. This is not one. That means someone is writing, it's going to write to this register. Who is that someone? That someone is the instruction that's allocated into reorder buffer entry, essentially of the writer instruction. So for example, if you're decoding add that writes into R3, uh, R4, I5, we'll ignore this for now. What you do is you need to allocate a reorder buffer entry for that add. You have a head pointer over here, which we introduced, and then a tail pointer. You allocate this add instruction, allocate a reorder buffer entry in the youngest location, and then increment the tail pointer, and then basically say this is valid, it's writing to R3, R3 is not available yet, dot, dot, dot. And also say R3 is not in the register file anymore. Even if, 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 if this was zero, you, it's still zero. If this was one, you turned into zero. Uh, R3 is not in the register file anymore. Don't trust the value that's here. It's garbage because somebody is going to write to that R3. For every later instruction, R3 is going to come from this instruction that's going to be in that location, the reorder buffer. And what is that location? I don't know, 255, let's say. Wherever that location is, basically, the tail pointer. I'll just make it at 131. You basically put 131 over here. This means that register three is not in the register file. It's going to be produced by this instruction that's in reorder buffer entry 131. Make sense? Now, the designer of this is happy. <laughs> and the designer of this is happy because you don't need to search for R3 in a content addressable way over here, right? You just turned the content addressability into a random access with an address because you added a level of indirection. That's the beauty of design. So you added a level of indirection so that you get rid of the content addressability. Make sense? Yes? Flushing is easy. Basically, if an instruction has an exception, uh, Let's do that over here. Oh, why is this so? Okay. So for some reason, let's say this instruction over here had an exception. Uh, you just get rid of all of the instruction in the end. 
you need to fix up the register file, which we're not going to talk about. <laughs> exactly. So that's a good question. You need to fix up the register file, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about. Existing machines fix up the register file. Yes? No, it, it, well, yes, certainly. The, the, the location is now bigger, right? It's not just 32-bit value, it's also the tag over here. I'll call this tag. It's a reorder of entry. But the register data value doesn't need to be bigger. Okay? <laughs> okay. So now you know how uh, the reorder buffer behaves. And you know that it doesn't need to be content addressable. We've eliminated this. So this is a real example of a reorder buffer like what we've talked about. Uh, this is out of order, it's not in order, but you will see that, uh, re remember the, the structure that we, we drew over here, that's going to be very useful in out of order execution soon. This uh, real machine, Pentium 4, and Intel wrote this beautiful paper that talks about Pentium 4. Basically, this is the register file I kind of drew, except they put the, physically these are the values in the register file. They call it the register alias table, which we're going to also call it soon. These are the eight registers in the old x86 architecture, not in x86-64. And basically, the values of the register can be in the architectural register file, the retirement register file, which is essentially this over here. Or they could be inside the reorder buffer, waiting to be written or already written by an instruction that's in the pipeline. Okay? So they have already, uh, this is the indirection that you have. This alias table basically gives you an indirection as to where you can find the value. Okay, so this is important. Again, I think a lot of these things are important. Uh, basically, what we've done is actually something really important in the sense that we've renamed this register. This register R3, it's just a name. We're referring to a value now. The R3 may come from this real place in the register file, or it could come from anywhere. As long as you get the right value, it's just a name, right? So basically, what we've done is we really eliminated the output and anti-dependencies. We'll talk about this. Uh, so these are not true dependencies. The same register refers to values that have nothing to do with each other. Remember, I showed you uh, writing in multiple instructions writing to R3. Right? These instructions are right to R3, but you really need the latest definition of R3 in the end. And they exist because uh, they lack, uh, you don't have enough register IDs in the instruction set architecture because the instruction encoding is small, right? There's no reason to write to R3 all the time, right? Because this R, if, if you have infinite number of names, locations, you would always write somewhere else. That's why these are not true dependencies uh, in the output. Okay, let me actually go, go to here first. So if you look over here, this is a true dependence. This instruction is producing R3, this instruction is consuming R3. There's a real data value need. This value definitely needs to be communicated over here. That's why this is called a true dependence or a flow dependence. You cannot eliminate these dependencies unless you change your algorithm somehow. Anti-dependence, this instruction is reading from R1, this instruction is writing to R1. There's no logical connection, right, in these data values. It's just a name. This instruction happened to read from R1, and somehow you write into R1 because you don't need R, uh, the, uh, the, the value uh, that's inside that location, inside that name anymore. That's how you do it. You could have changed this to R a million, and nothing semantically would have changed over here, right? Similarly, this output dependence, if you look over here, this instruction is writing to R3, this instruction is also writing to R3, these have nothing to do with each other semantically. This R3 is produced by this instruction. This R3, this instruction can produce a completely different R3, and they're not communicating with each other. That's why these, these dependencies are not true dependencies. They're called anti and output. And we've essentially eliminated them. How have we done it? Basically, the register ID is renamed to the reorder buffer entry that will hold the register's value. So we're mapping the register's ID to the reorder buffer entry ID. It's also called architectural register ID. Essentially, we're mapping it to a physical register ID. And after renaming, the reorder of entry ID is used to refer to the register. And this is going to be a key component to ensure that we actually get correct results when we execute out of order. So now we've eliminated this anti and output dependencies with this sort of renaming structure. 
uh, this just gives us the illusion that there are uh, a large number of registers. So let me finish this, and then we're going to start with out of order execution. Uh, so basically, this is the pipeline we built. This is our in order pipeline with a reorder buffer. You get in order dispatch. So whenever you're decoding, you decode in order. If there is a, a true dependence, you stole the entire pipeline. But if there is a not true dependence, anti and output dependence, this pipeline still, flow, still flows. Only in true dependencies uh, you stall. Uh, instructions can complete out of order because of multiple cycle execution, and then you reorder them, and then you write to the register file when the instruction becomes the oldest. So in the decode stage, you access the register file and the reorder buffer, you allocate an entry in the reorder buffer in order, check if the instruction can execute, it doesn't have a true dependency. If it doesn't have a true dependency to any of the values over here that are inside, you can dispatch the instruction. And you know how to do that with scoreboarding, for example. Uh, in execute stage, instructions can complete out of order because of multiple cycle execution and different functional units. And when an instruction completes, it writes its result into the reorder buffer. And there is a state machine at the end that checks for the oldest instruction in the reorder buffer. If the oldest instruction uh, is ready, uh, and if it doesn't have any exceptions, uh, its result is written in the architecture register file or memory. Otherwise, if there is an exception, uh, when the oldest instruction is ready, you flush the pipeline and start from the exception hand. And this works beautifully. So let me finish with the advantage and disadvantage. So reorder buffer is actually really important. Uh, because you need to reorder the instructions for the von Neumann model. It's a conceptually very simple for supporting precise exceptions, but we've added significant complexity into the pipeline for reordering. So this is kind of like the von Neumann tax that we're paying for sequential instruction processing. We want high performance, but we need to pay this tax, hardware overhead, power overhead, all of these structures that we added are actually adding power overhead. And, but we are gaining something also, we can eliminate false dependencies now, anti and output dependencies. But of course, there are disadvantages because if we want to get high performance, we need to access the reorder buffer to get the results that are yet to be written to the register file that are produced but not updated to the architectural state. So you need to use either content addressable memory or indirection. Either way, content addressable memory increases complexity clearly, but it also increases latency because the timing is very long. Indirection also increases your latency, right? You access the register file first, to get the reorder buffer ID, and then you need to access the reorder buffer. So there's an indirection, there's additional latency, except that latency can be broken into multiple cycles. That's good. So other solutions that we have not covered, and we're not going to cover, actually eliminate the disadvantages. So existing processors actually employ multiple of these. Definitely future file checkpointing plus reorder buffer, they combine all of these to get uh, a better solution than just a reorder buffer. Like one of your colleagues asked the question, how do you construct the register file when you flush the pipeline? It's actually not that easy. And that's the idea of the future files actually to help that. But we're not gonna cover. If you're interested, you can read the paper that uh, I referenced earlier. So I think that's a good time to take a break. We'll start with out of order execution. <laughs>